for you personally, you know, in your sport, you kind of, you reach the pinnacle, right? You've got four Olympic medals, two gold, two silver. When you kind of take time to reflect on your career, what are some thoughts that come to mind? Um, man, that was fun. Um, <laughs> now that I can like sit back and think about it, it's awesome. Um, but definitely when I was in the moment, I, my knees were shaking. They were buckled in every opportunity because, um, I will say my first medal in 2008 for the four by 100 relay, the French team was talking smack that they were there to crush the Americans. Michael's going for eight gold medals. Um, and here's my first debut and I'm a deer in headlights in Beijing, China, which I've never been to. So it was, uh, I, I was nervous. And from every uh, opportunity, I, I, I was just terrified, but at the same time, I knew I trained, I did the work and all of the normal stuff you hear athletes say, I put the work in 110%. I did all of that, but there's nothing that can compare you, uh, prepare you, sorry, for being behind the block or walking on the court or being on the field um, when it's crunch time. And so I, I consider myself blessed to be able to, to do what I was able to do, but I have to say like it, it took over. People ask me all the time, I do a lot of public speaking. And they're like, what were you thinking? I have no idea. It was like a moment where my brain just like shut off and I was just going through the motions. Um, but that, that's all the training that I did. Yeah, it's so funny, like how you, you never know how you're gonna react in the moment. And I kind of think I like, I look back on some things or you know some like cool events I got to cover or live shots I got to do. And I'm like, I have no clue what I just said or what that moment was even like. I, Cause you're just, your adrenaline's going. You're just kind of so hyped up just to, to be there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's um, exactly uh, any athlete that i've talked to they say the same thing it's like yeah. it just kind of flows like how did you make that last second shot mm -hmm. i've been practicing it for years <laughs> <laughs> right it's just a natural reaction at that point you don't yeah. even think about it yep. uh and then obviously we have the olympics coming up this summer hopefully things will will be a go but uh when it comes <laughs> to the the swim team for, for team usa you know what do you think the expectations are and, and what are some things that you see happening you know, they just put out uh, the criteria and what it's going to look like for Olympic trials. Um, and for those that don't know, our trials for swimming are a month before the actual games. A lot of other countries, they do it, you know, months before the team gets to be together. We do it a month before we're together for um, a month and then we just start competing. So um, we just saw what it looks like. It looks very different, which would be expected given COVID and everything that's been going on. Ashley, I'm just happy we're having an Olympic trials and hopefully an Olympics um, at this point. Uh, so many of my friends have, um, they've had to really change and adjust their lives. And for, you know, swimmers, my era, Ryan Lochte, um, that's hard to tack on another year when you've been planning for this is it, I'm done after, oh wait, another year. So I think for a lot of the athletes, uh, there was a lot of mental adjustment, um, you know, they. I think a big thing that people need to talk about is the mental side of things. You know, we can physically train for these types of things, but when things get derailed as much as not having something that happens every four years, um, it, it does a lot to your psyche. So um, I commend a lot of my teammates, a lot of the people that I've seen that are training for 2021 um, because they've been able to hold it together. Um, and, and so I'm excited. I think that a lot of them took the, the mentality that, you know, another year means I can get a year better. Um, and I'm happy that people thought of it that way because it's very easy to go down the route of, well, this didn't go the way I wanted it to go and now I'm gonna, no. Everyone was like, you know what? Another year, we're gonna get better, so. Yeah, that, that's good to hear because like you said, I, I feel like a lot of people, it's just, there, there has to be frustrations there, right? Like it's another year of changing your lifestyle or if that was gonna be your last Olympic games, well, now you've got to add another year onto it. You know, you got to go to the trials. Will I make the team and, and, and all of that. So it's a kind of a roller coaster. I feel like for every athlete that wanted to compete in 2020. Absolutely. And then the thought, I mean, you got to think about it. They've trained all the way to March. They were almost there. <laughs> you know, they only had, some of them had already made the team. And then I, I, I want to look into other other uh, countries that do their teams earlier. Do they just keep the same team or do they have another trials? Um, at least for us, since we were so close to the Olympics, we never got to do a trials, but places like Australia, they do theirs, you know, six months in advance. So I'm happy our team is is well, mentally well and physically will be ready. I'm, I'm expecting a lot of gold medals this year. There we go. 
<laughs> bringing home the bill. <laughs> and then for you, when you kind of go back to the beginning of your journey, I know in, in some of the stories that I've read or interviews that you've done in the past, you know, there's a story of you being five years old and nearly drowning and being resuscitated. Like that's kind of how things started for you in the water. And I think for a lot of kids, they would never want to go near it again. And, and you turned it into your passion. And, and so I'm just kind of curious when you go back to that moment, you know, what comes to mind? Yeah, I had some strict parents. That wasn't me. I was terrified. <laughs> I didn't want to get back in the water. My mom was like, yeah, never again. Um, we're going to get you swim lessons. And so um, I've been working with an initiative called Make a Splash for 13 years after I got my gold, first gold medal in 2008. And um, that was the focus is to try to never have a parent go through what my mom went through of me almost drowning and then having to make that change. Because we see, um, especially in the black community, parents that have that issue with water or a, a negative experience around water tend to project that onto their children. Like they think of water like fire, hot, stay away, don't go near the water. And so I'm, I'm thankful every day that my parents thought differently and said, you know, we're not going to limit you from water. We're going to teach you how to be safer around the water, um, which was a definitely a revolutionary thought in, in the 90s. So um, I'm thankful for them. But that's why I have so much purpose now. And, and I'm still even retired, still pushing how important it is to learn how to swim. I'm a firm believer that uh, kids need to get in the water and learn at a young age. We come from water, stay in the water, learn to be safe around the water. And um, Ashley, the good thing is, is that thanks to COVID, some things have, you know, kind of slowed down. But the one thing that hasn't is swim lessons. Um, the CDC came out and said that COVID cannot be transmitted between, um, on top of chlorinated water. So my son's in swim lessons. So go get your kids uh, water safe. Yeah, Summer's coming around the more safe. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was going to ask, uh, you know, future swimmer. So he's already getting swim lessons. So do we think maybe we can, you know, I know he's young, but can we turn this into, uh, I saw the picture, the side by side on Instagram. He had the goggles oh, yeah. on next to you. I was like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, he loves the water. It's kind of terrifying that, I mean, he loves it more than even I did as a kid. Um, I would sit and play in, in the tub for hours, but when he was a child, six months, see, I got it right that time, at six months, um, the only way we could stop him from crying was running water. We had to turn the faucet on. My water bill was ridiculous that month, but it calmed him down and he stopped crying. And he always, to this day, is if he sees water, he wants to get in it, he wants to touch it. So, I want him to do whatever he wants. If he wants to play basketball, I support it, anything. I just want him to be in sport because I feel like sport taught me so much and teaches so much about teamwork. It's not all about you, all of those things. Um, I want him to be in a sport. That, that's all that, that I care about. It doesn't have to be swimming, but if he chooses it, I don't think I can coach him because I, I think I get too emotionally attached. So uh, I might have to ask one of my friends to coach him. We'll see. <laughs> all right. I can't wait to see how, how it all plays out. So, <laughs> um, And then you also mentioned in 2008 when you won the gold medal, then you were kind of on this platform worldwide, really, especially here in, in, in the States. But that's, you know, the Olympics are global. So everyone's seeing that. And then you kind of made it your mission to educate people how to swim. So what were those moments like and, and why was that so important for you? You know, it, it started when I got off the plane right after 2008 and I landed in New York. I'm originally born in New York and grew up in New Jersey and I'm around Times Square walking around and this little, little kid comes up to me. He's like, oh my God, can I get your autograph? And in my first thought is, I'm not a track runner. I'm, I don't play basketball. Sorry, I'm a swimmer. Yeah, 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 you were the one in the relay. And from that moment, my life completely changed because more and more people knew me. And if they didn't know Colin Jones, they knew, oh, the black guy that swam in the Olympics. That, you, that was you. Yeah, okay, I became that guy, and which was fine. Um, over the years, it became synonymous with learn to swim, which is exactly what I wanted it to do. I wanted my platform to, to be... Uh, kind of like a tiger or, or a Serena and Venus or Jackie Robinson, where it's, it's okay to do this sport. It's okay. There were people before me, mind you, there were a ton of people before me, but I was blessed enough to be a part of a relay that the world saw. And so I wanted to use that platform to try to be a, a role model as best I could. And the way for me to be able to do that was to get people to understand how important it is to learn to swim. So I've been doing it for 13 years. We've seen the numbers drop a little bit. They're ticking up, unfortunately, due to COVID, but I'm hard at work. I'm still going to keep pushing. 
Is there a moment from those experiences with helping others and educating others that stands out to you more than the rest? Maybe I know they're all important, but I feel like sometimes we have these moments and it's like, okay, like that's why I'm doing it. Absolutely. So uh, what year was that? That had to be 2009, right after 2008, I just kind of made the the uh, commitment to make a splash and working with USA Swimming and Phillips 66 about doing this. And then seven kids in Shreveport passed away trying to save the other child. One drowned trying to save the other who tried to save the other. And it was just a horrific um, story. And I remember the day it broke on the news, I was getting ready to race the 50 freestyle to go to world championships. So it was a huge moment for me uh, to, to really need to be focused and focused on swimming. But the only thing I could think about were these seven children that passed away trying to save each other. Um, I ended up, God willing, making the team. But that year when we went to the different tour stops for uh, Make a Splash, we ended up changing one, I think it was from Atlanta to Shreveport, Louisiana. And I was able to go. And although we weren't able to talk to the families of you know the children that passed away, the community was so broken. And, and I was in the pool and there were eight kids and they were all scurrying back away from the, the pool. They were crying. And within 30 minutes, I had them all in the water jumping to me. Some of them put their face in the water. And it was just a moment that like brought me to tears because I realized how important this was. Like it was, you're not only those now, those children are now water safe. They've gone and continued their swim lessons. I get letters from them. Um, and that was one of our first stops. And so when people say like, where do you find your motivation? I've got letters from kids that are just like, you saved my life. Like that, that you can't ask for more. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's very powerful to know that you went, you know, to that community that had suffered such great loss and, and educated kids there. So they won't have the same, you know, the same result. It's hard because everywhere we go, there's always, I mean, it's the second leading cause of accidental death under the age of 14. So you see it in every community, everywhere that you go. So it's a little gloomy, but at the same time, you know, you're making a difference. So you've broken so many barriers. And I know, like you mentioned, there were people that came before you, but you know, you were really, I feel like the first face that everyone saw that you said, you know, even in Times Square, a little boy's running up to you. He may not know your name, but he knows who you are and that kind of thing. So just to know that there are so many kids then and now that look up to you, what does that mean to you? You know, it, it, it kind of cemented um, a moment for me was 2016 and uh, I was training for Rio and I missed it by a 10th and it crushed me. Um, and I wanted to be there. I wanted to swim that 50 free, but I was home. And I watched from my couch as Simone Manuel touched the wall. And I had just talked to her probably about, obviously I saw her at the meet, but I, I talked to her two months before about flip turns and just like technical stuff. And the first thing she said after giving glory to God was I couldn't have done it without Colin Jones and Maritza Cry and said my name. And I just broke down and started. I, I say I cry a lot in this interview, but that doesn't happen a lot. But this was a moment, okay, guys? It was a moment. So, I, I mean, I was, I, I, it hit me. It hit me that, um, you know, after eight years at that point in the sport, I had that much of an impact on other people because I know that that wasn't the reason why I started swimming. I swam because I loved it, but I knew I was on the right path if I could see what happened after me. I'm watching, you know, Simone Manuel touch first, Leah Neal making her second Olympic team. You know, it, it's history being made. And, you know, if they, I don't ask for anything, but the fact that she was able, she said my name was, was a moment for me. And so um, I don't take role model uh, lightly. I take it very seriously. And so another thing that we did after the George Floyd, um, I don't even like calling it an incident, what happened to George Floyd. Um, we got a lot of the black swimmers together and it was one of those moments where for me personally, uh, I knew I needed to do something. I didn't know what I was going to do. And so what we did was we got all the black swimmers together. We talked to USA Swimming, our national governing body, and they put out a statement that really supported us. And so 
we were thankful for that. And, and for me, it was another way of, of making the sport that is considered a very white sport more inclusive um, and, and trying to be a role model again. So I, I don't think my, I might've retired and even though I don't think I ever said I retired, um, they kind of put me to pasture. Um, I still feel like I'm being a role model in every way I can possibly be for the sport. Yeah, absolutely. And when I type your name in, I mean, it's amazing all the stuff that comes up, you know, when you I'm busy, actually, they keep me busy. <laughs> I was like, he, literally, I was like, wait, he did this interview win and this and this and he's still doing doing this. So yeah, I don't I don't think you retired. You might not, you know, be competing all the time, but you're far from being Just retired. Shifted lane. Just shifted lanes. Just shifted lanes. <laughs> Uh, and I had mentioned to, to one of my friends that I was doing this interview and he was like, well, you know, growing up, we didn't have access to pools, right? It just wasn't a thing in our community being a minority. And so I'm just curious, have you seen that change at all? Like, have you seen minorities get better access to the pool or you still think that's something that, that really needs to be addressed? Oh, it definitely still needs to be addressed, Ashley. I mean, it's, it's definitely a problem. It just depends on where you are. Um, I grew up in Jersey, New York area. Yes, there are pools, but a lot of them are being filled in now because it's expensive to upkeep a pool. Um, I, there's no getting around that. That's just the, the fact of the matter. And for parents, a lot of it is making sure and taking the effort, making the time to get your child to swim lessons, getting them to swim practice if they're really competitive. Um, so it's not getting easier, it's getting harder, but that's more of the reason why we need to have things like the Make a Splash initiative and other initiatives to try to get kids not only to understand that swimming is not just a great sport, it's a life skill, but also to keep this sport that we keep winning in. I mean, we have not lost in 60 years. Come on, people, we need to support swimming. So it, it, it's definitely um, something that access is a big deal. And uh I can't speak specifically for your friend, although I think I have an idea who it is, um, but they're right. You know, it, it's, it, it is, depending upon where you are, it is very hard to get swim lessons or it's very hard to even get to a pool. Um, for me personally, I had to take two public buses to get to practice every day when I was eight years old, different times, but I was motivated. That's what I wanted to do. So it is an issue. Um, when you look at the past, I mean, it, it's grim and dark, you know, and, and we have the civil rights in 1964, 1963, that iconic picture of a bunch of black kids in a, in a hotel pool and the white manager is pouring bleach on them. Like that was one of the big pieces to start the civil rights movement was that image and what happened. So it's a big issue. It's something that we still deal with to this day. Um, is it getting better in some ways, in some respects? Yes, when you have a Simone Manuel or a Leah Neal or a Reese, or I can go down the list now. And I couldn't do that before. When it was knee swimming, it was knee swimming. And now there's seven different people, actually probably closer to 10 different people that are in striking reigns of making the Olympic team. That's amazing. And they're all, all people of color. Well, I'll just say they are all black Americans. That's amazing. That's something that's never happened before. So I feel like every day we're, we're, we're pushing that needle. It's getting somewhat better in some respects, other ways we need to fix, you know, access being one of them, but we're getting there. Yeah. You just mentioned, like, I think I read this before the interview, this could be the very first Olympics where both on the men and women's swim team, there could be multiple, right. Multiple yes. black swimmers. And I think I was like, in 2021, like our, it just blows my mind. And then another stat that I read was, I think of the United States swim team uh, for black swimmers, it's at 1%. And I just, it's just like, when you hear the stats and the numbers and the fact that we're in 2021 and those are realities, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. I mean, if you start thinking about the first of certain things, so the first black woman to get a medal was in 2004, Maritza Karaya. I was the first black swimmer to get a world record in 2008. Anthony Irvin was the first black swimmer in 2000. And we've been doing this for over 60 years in the Olympics and winning Team USA. It's just starting now that we're seeing this, this shift in the sport of more inclusiveness. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful thing to be a part of it. And I'm just blessed to people keep throwing my name in there somehow. Um, but I'm just happy to be a part of it. <laughs> And before we kind of switch gears, you brought up George Floyd and how that really sparked something within you and 
you know, you and a group kind of got together and had discussions and then your sport backed you and embraced you. And, and so I'm just kind of curious if you go back to that, you know, what were your emotions? I, I know you had an experience yourself personally within the yeah. last year. It was uh, 24 hours after George Floyd, uh, the incident with George Floyd, I was coming out of, you know, my house and I saw a police officer driving by because he lives in the neighborhood and he whipped around and I heard whoop whoop and I heard the siren go off and I'm like, what's going on? And so I have a French bulldog. Many people know how expensive French bulldogs are. I have a nice car. I have a nice, you know, I grew up in the hood, but I've worked my butt off to not still live in the hood. Um, so I've got a nice house now and I've got a nice car and I've got a nice dog. And the dog, uh, the, the police officer comes up to me and starts, basically he starts off with, is everything okay? And I knew I'd been working late, um, just took this role at Speedo and they're West Coast. So I'm still working late at night and I walk out to walk my dog and I'm like, what's, yeah, everything's fine, officer. And he's like, oh, okay, well, you know, what kind of puppy is that? I'm like, no, it's full grown, he's seven. He's like, what kind of dog? French bulldog, oh, okay. And to make the story shorter, I had to explain my excessive or extensive, sorry, extensive knowledge of dogs, which isn't much, but basically he ended again with, oh, I just wanted to make sure everything was okay. And for me, I've had a lot of people come back and if you've never had interaction with a police officer and been black, you know what's going on. Because when I called my black friends, they go, what? And they were upset. And I have friends that are of other races and they were like, well, maybe they were just trying to show you that not all police officers are bad. And, and I don't think that because I have many friends that are police officers and I pray for them every night when, because I know their job is difficult. But what he did was not that. He questioned me because, and whipped his car around because I was a black man in this really nice neighborhood with this nice house, this expensive dog and this expensive car. And I bring up my one and a half year old child because what hit me at that moment was, what if I had been drinking? What if I was at a party? What if I was celebrating something and I wasn't able linguistically to prove to this man who has a gun that I am where I'm supposed to be? And I have to teach my son how to do that. It broke me, Ashley. It literally broke me. And I went back into the room, you know, I saw my brother-in-law, he said the same thing. And I was just like, yeah, but, and I just broke down into tears because I've been in situations like this before, but this was the first situation that I'd been in where I had a child. Mm -hmm. And so at that moment, I had never ever used my social media beyond to be political, to say anything. I've always kept it neutral because I wanted uh, companies to be able to come and work with me as a brand and use my, you know, businessman type stuff. But I couldn't after that. It broke me and I needed to share my experience. I needed to, to get that out for, to be cathartic. I don't know, but I just, I knew I couldn't be quiet anymore. So I said something and my life turned again <laughs> for the better. Um, it was, it became, you know, thank you so much for saying what you said and sharing your story. And it, it became another platform that I feel like I developed within my evolution of being a swimmer. Now I am a board member for USA Swimming Foundation. It, and I think a large part of that is because I showed leadership at that moment, working with all the black swimmers to try to build something for the future. Um, it's just another pillar to, to my development. So it, it's, it's definitely made me understand why we need to have change, especially in my sport, but across the world, we need to be united. We need to change this. Sorry, got long-winded there. <laughs> no, that, I mean, that's very powerful. I'm, I'm glad you shared it. And it's, you know, it's so interesting. You know, I'm having the conversation with you and I talked to Sha Shaq Thompson during the football season, you know, Bubba Wallace and everyone has a similar story. And I think now we're finally to the point where people are like, I need to speak on this because you guys see us in our sport, in our element. You don't think it could be me. You don't think it could be you. Well, it could be any of us, you know? And I think, like you said, I know it, you have that moment and you're like, well, I try to not do anything on social media, but I have to. And, and like yeah. the result was, uh, you know, great for you. And a lot of people you felt your pain and now you're on the board of directors and you can kind of help carry that everything that you started even further within your sport. So. All because I just want to say this, Ashley, because this is very important. 
still haters. They're, they're still there. I still got a lot of that too. I want everybody out there because I do a lot of talking about social bullying and all of that as well. That still appears, but to all those listening, screw the haters. You do what you feel. Boom. Okay, keep going. No, absolutely. <laughs> I can, there, I'm with you. I, social media can be a beautiful thing and it can also be like the pit oh. of everything. I can't, I can't even log on I'm like post and I'm done. That's it. Do what you want with it. Yep. So I, I can't imagine. Put it down, walk away. Yeah. Put it down, walk, walk away. Walk away. <laughs> don't interact. Let it go. <laughs> yep. Oh, social just... media. We can, we can do a whole show on social media. Oh. <laughs> mm, couple days show. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I know that you recently took a position with Speedo, your, you know, with the philanthropic branch. And I know that's something you're really excited about. So what has that been like since you, you joined that part of their team? It has been amazing. Um, I originally, in 2018, um, wild part of my life was I took a break from school to pursue the Olympics. And um, when I missed it in 16, was in kind of like this really dark headspace because I was like, what do I do now? I'm not, you know, I didn't make the team. And um, the CEO and uh, the late CEO of USA Swimming, Chuck Wilgus, said to me, he's like, well, what haven't you finished? And it was school. So I went back to school. And in 2018, I was applying for a marketing job. I ended up not, I mean, I got the job, but it just, a lot of things happened. I ended up not getting, fully getting the job. And so I was looking in Charlotte and I started working at Novant Foundation. Never would have thought that I would have been working in philanthropy at all. Um, I, my mindset was always a business to do something else. Um, but the work that I did with, with uh, Make a Splash and with USA Swimming and developing that, just completely trans translated over into philanthropy. And I started to love it. I started loving talking to people and understanding, you know, when it came to a grateful patient or whatever it may be, why they were giving, understanding why people gave. Well, it got the notice of you of Speedo. And uh, our president, Jim Gerson, came back to Speedo and said, Cullen, I want you back. I want you to come back and I want you to uh, basically lead our, our, our philanthropic arm. And it was perfect for me. It's a perfect fit. I love it. Um, it keeps me busy, <laughs> but at the same time, being able to, to see why people give and, and to give back to the sport, um, especially now with COVID going on, there's teams that need help. There's actually everybody needs help at this point. And it is my job to try to, to relieve some of that. So I wake up every morning with different purpose and just happy to be kicking butt where, where I am. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, I was going to ask, kind of going back to the Olympics, because I was about to say, is there anything else we should have talked about? But I do want to know where your medals are. Where do they? Well, I was going to ask, kind of going back to the Olympics, because I was about to say, is there anything else we should have talked about? But I do want to know where your medals are. Where do they stay now that, mm. you know? <laughs> They're in the office. I'm in my I'm in my makeshift office. My house is being built, so okay. I have a makeshift office, and they're here for. All right, we got them on the hand. Interview. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm glad I asked it. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people, um, they're like, "Where do you put it? Like, where would you put it?" And everyone's like, "Oh, I put it in a." I have heard a lot of socks, drawers, but I ended up growing up and getting a safe, so it's in the safe now. But okay. Yeah, it was definitely under my bed for a while. Not even gonna lie. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Where else do you hide most important Transparency, things? Transparency, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever do you ever put them back on? You're like, hey, let me just relive the moment a little bit. Never. All my family and friends that come to the house, they're like, oh, let me see the medal. <laughs> Here, sure. Knock it out. I mean, I think I've probably looked at it more since I've retired, but mm -hmm. When I was training, I rarely ever saw them. I never pulled them out. I only did it when I went to events or was doing a speaking engagement. Um, now, and I always said, I was like, I'm always on the next one, on to the next one, on to the next one. So now that I'm done, yeah, I, I look at them a little bit more now than I ever have. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, I don't know what I would do if, if I had one. I think I might have to have it out in the house just so I could walk by and be like, yep. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, perfect. I so appreciate your time. I always like to ask, is there anything I should have asked about or touched on that, that we didn't? 
come on, Ashley, social media. Just follow me on my name, Cullen Jones. Does anyone <laughs> want to follow me? Keep up with all the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and if you have any ideas on partnering and figuring out different ways to do things where we give back to the community, I'm all ears. <laughs>